And it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Rob Lustig. Rob has become a friend and a mentor over the last few years. I saw Rob present, I think the first time was at our uh, Memphis in May forum in, I want to say, May of 2019. And Rob isn't about fad diets and self-help, but his message for me, I took it very personally, and I was able to lose 50 pounds and completely transform my way of eating, my way of exercising, my way of looking at food, my way of looking at life. And I credit that first and foremost to Rob Lustig. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing Rob present about a month ago in Memphis. Um, so it's been a number of times now, but I could not be more thrilled than to invite Rob to the stage. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Paul, and uh, for that very heartfelt introduction, I have to say that that is about as uh, heartfelt as I've uh, ever heard and uh, so personal, and I, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank Carter as well for uh, inviting me and for his confidence uh, in going forward. Some of you might think that I am the enemy of the food industry. I am no such thing. I'm actually your best friend that you haven't met yet. And I will try to show you why that is. First of all, you like my t-shirt, okay? So you, for those who can't see, it says affordable health care, all right? Now, the problem with this t-shirt is it costs 60 bucks and I had to buy it in Sweden. Why is there no t-shirt like that here in America? That's what I wanna know. And the reason is because we don't know what affordable health care is and the way things are going, I'm not sure if we ever will. So the title of my talk is Food is Health, because that's the you know, uh, theme of the uh, conference today. What's your fix? Now, I'm here to tell you that both of those are loaded statements. Food is health, except we just learned from Nancy Roman that food is disease. And what's your fix? I want to focus on that word fix for a minute. Because fix has three meanings. The fix is in, which it is. I need my fix, which we do. And how do we fix this? And that's what we're really here for today. But you're not going to be able to fix this if you don't understand the first two. Now. Nancy laid out the fact that we have a health care crisis. We do. But it's not just us. It's the entire world now. Everyone's got the same health care crisis we do. We're just the worst at it. Commonwealth Fund just released on September 8th their newest assessment of health care around the world. And guess where the United States came in? Dead last. Dead last with all of the money, with all of the hospitals, with all of the technology, we came in dead last. Why is that? It's on this slide. Okay? This slide shows healthcare expenditures on the x-axis compared to life expectancy on the y-axis over time. And what you can see is that the OECD countries, yeah, they've gotten a little less efficient over time, no argument, everyone has, because they've got the same problem we do, just not quite as bad. But take a look at the United States, that red line. We started falling off the rails around 1975. And look where things are going. And now, the United States now has the um, uh, four years in a row declining life expectancy. The more money we put in, the quicker we die. Now, why is that? And what are we going to do about it? Add more money to it? And if you, somehow you think Medicare for all is going to fix that problem, you know, I have a bridge right over there to sell you. 
That's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is on this slide. This is the iron law. You cannot fix health care until you fix health. You cannot fix health until you fix diet. And you cannot fix diet until you know what the hell is wrong. And we've been getting it wrong for the last 50 years. Now, Nancy Roman mentioned three things that were wrong with our diet. Too much fat, too much salt, and too much sugar. And I am here to tell you, she is dead wrong. That is not true. Our ancestors, before refrigeration, ships would go out into the Atlantic and you know, catch big marlin and tuna and sockeye salmon. And it was going to be months before they ever made port. How did they preserve the fish all that time? They packed it in salt. How much salt? In fact, our ancestors consumed 15 grams of salt per day. And they didn't have hypertension. We consume 6.9 grams of salt per day. And 50% of us have hypertension. We eat 40% as much, and we have a thousand times more hypertension. In fact, you can reduce your sodium content, uh, salt content of your diet down to 2.3 grams per day, and still 20% of America has hypertension. So how come 15 grams didn't do it, but 2.3 does, if it's salt? And the reason is because it's not the salt. It's whether you can get rid of the salt. Our kidneys are very adept at getting rid of salt. When your insulin is low. When your insulin is low. But if your insulin is not low, then you resorb all that salt, in which case, then one gram of sodium is too much. You have to be able to use that kidney as a filter, and we're not. We're holding on to it, and that's why we all have hypertension. That insulin is the indicator of metabolic health. And 88.0% 88 of Americans today have a high fasting insulin level. They have poor metabolic health, and it is unrelated to obesity. She said in her, uh, uh, in her uh, presentation that, yes, one half of, of uh, uh, America is obese. And that is true, but it's not about obesity. And that's shown on this slide. So on the left, this is called an MRI fat fraction map. And what it does is it shows you where the fat is. And what you can see on the left is a healthy person. Obese, yes. Notice the love handles. But I want you to take a look in the red at this guy's liver. It's dark. 2.6% liver fat. This guy is a metabolically healthy, obese person. This guy is not going to cost the taxpayer a dime. This guy will live a completely normal life, probably outlive you. This guy even has normal length telomeres, the edges of the chromosomes that unravel, that determine whether or not your cells die and therefore whether you die. Nothing wrong with this guy. Now look at the guy in the middle. Now this is what you would more likely expect to see. Obesity, yes, plus Take a look at that liver, ground glass appearance, 23, 24% liver fat. This guy's got metabolic syndrome. This guy's got abnormal metabolic health. This guy going to die. Now take a look at the guy on the right. Notice, no obesity, but take a look at his liver, 23% liver fat. This guy's just as sick as the guy in the center. Thin sick, fat sick fat healthy. So the moral of this story is it's not the fat you can see that counts. It's the fat you can't. And it turns out particularly the fat in the liver that counts. And now numerous studies have demonstrated that that's the fat we have to deal with. And the question is, where would that fat come from? So in order to answer that question, 
we have to ask the question, okay, what food got that liver fat there? And in order to answer that question, we have to ask the question, what's food? So I'm going to ask you, is ultra-processed food food? Well, what's the definition of food? Come on, you're all food industry executives. What's the definition of food? Anyone? The FDA has a definition. It's low in calories, low in sodium, low in uh, saturated fat, high in magnesium. That's a definition of food, really? The USDA doesn't even have a definition of food because if they did, then no one could put a health claim on any package and the whole thing would fall down. All right, so you tell me, what's the definition of food? Go to Webster's. Here it is. Substrate that contributes to the growth or burning of an organism. That is food. Substrate that contributes to growth or burning of an organism. Okay, I'll buy that. But what if some substrate actually inhibits burning? Turns out, there's one that we consume every day. And we consume a lot of it. And it was put in the food, by the food industry, on purpose to make you buy more. And this substrate is called sugar. Fructose, in particular, the sweet molecule in sugar, the addictive molecule in sugar. And this slide is just to show you that Though those mitochondria down at the bottom where it says beta oxidation, glucose, which is the energy of life, actually helps speed up mitochondria. But fructose, because it inhibits three mitochondrial enzymes, AMP kinase, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, and carnitine palmitoyl transferase one, do not worry, you will not be tested on this. That molecule fructose actually causes mitochondria to become defective. In fact, fructose is a mitochondrial toxin. It causes the inhibition of burning. This was shown also by Dr. Kevin Hall at the NIH in a study where he basically uh, did a crossover study where he took people and he fed them the exact same composition of food with the same protein and the same fat and the same carbohydrate, even the same sugar, but it was either processed or unprocessed. And it turned out when they fed them the ultra-processed food, they burned less and gained weight faster on the same number of calories because their mitochondria were not working. So we now know that ultra-processed food, and sugar in particular, inhibits burning. Okay, now let's take the other part of that definition, growth. This is work from my colleague in uh, Jerusalem, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan, who's the head of the Department of Nutrition at Hebrew University there. And what she showed is that sugar and by proxy, ultra-processed food actually inhibits cortical bone growth. You take a look on the right, and you can see the red, that's cortical bone. And you can see where it says EUPF, ultra-processed food. It's thinned. And you can see down at the bottom left, you can see how the entire bone is thinned. We now know that the Dutch, who are the tallest people in the world, are shrinking this generation because of ultra-processed food. And we also know that that same ultra-processed food causes, instead of real growth, it causes abnormal growth in the form of cancer. And every 10% increase in ultra-processed food consumption leads to a 12% increase in cancer development in Europe. So. Sugar and its vehicle, if sugar is the payload, ultra-processed food is the vehicle, does it contribute to growth? Does it contribute to burning? In fact, it inhibits both. 
So is ultra-processed food food? I would argue that, in fact, ultra-processed food is poison because it does not meet the criteria, the definition for food. Now, that may shake up a lot of people in this room, or it may delight some of the people in this room. All right? And we can talk about that later in the panel discussion. Point is, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. 56% of all of the food sold in America today is ultra-processed food. It accounts for 62% of our sugar payload and 67% of the sugar payload for kids. And you can see it's in everything. And why is it in everything? Because the food industry learned back in the 1980s when we took the fat out of the food, ostensibly because of cardiovascular disease, which turns out to be completely wrong and completely not true. And we can spend an hour and a half talking about how they got that wrong and why they got that wrong. And the, by the way, the American Heart Association has now walked that back 50 years later. Okay. The point is that that, that sugar in that ultra-processed food is addictive. It stimulates the exact same area of the brain as alcohol and cocaine and heroin and nicotine. And when they add it, you buy more, which of course is why they add it. So that's your fix. That's your fix. So what happened to our health care when processed food entered our lexicon? So this is a graph of sugar consumption over the course of the last 200 years. So our ancestors getting food, <coughs> getting uh, you know, sugar out of uh, fruits and vegetables and the occasional honey, consumed about five pounds of sugar per year, no problem. Then we had the 19th century with CNH and Domino and Texas, Louisiana, Hawaii, and you can see the upswing. And you can see where stabilization occurred, where price met demand. And then you can see the rationing of World War II right there. And then you see the advent of ultra-processed food basically in the mid-50s to 60s. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to overlay on this the percent of GDP spent on health care for the exact same period of time. Ready? What do you see? Ultra-processed food is the driver of our health care crisis. And as Carter said, $1.7 trillion a year in food, of which $800 billion is gross profit for the food industry. But we spend $3.5 trillion a year on health care, of which 75% is chronic disease, of which 75% of that could be prevented if we fixed this problem. So 75% of 75% of 3.5 trillion is $1.9 trillion a year going down a rat hole. We spend triple what the food industry makes cleaning up their mess. This is unsustainable, and this is why System A does not work. And the, early, the quicker you all sign on to the fact that System A does not work, the better off we will all be. Harvard came out with a, an article just a week ago, two weeks ago, I believe this was, basically showing how many lives we would save and how much money we would recoup if we just got the sugar down in ultra-processed food. Just that one simple uh, task. But of course, it's not so simple. Because food industry uses it as a humectant, as a bulking agent, as a browning agent, and of course, because it's addictive. So we need healthy food. But what is healthy? How do you define healthy? Can anyone define healthy for me? Anyone? What's healthy? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And I'm going to tell you, the USDA has a, a definition, it does not have a definition of healthy. FDA's definition of healthy is also just as garbage as their definition of food. Bottom line, I'm going to give you one. And it actually works. It empirically works. 
and I uh, wrote it in the book you're going to get at the end of the day called Metabolical, and I'll show you and explain to you why it works. Two things. All you have to know is two things. Protect the liver, feed the gut. Protect the liver, feed the gut. Six words. Michael Pollan said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. All three wrong. Because eat food, well, I just showed you processed food is not food, it's poison. Not too much, you know what? If you ate unprocessed food, you wouldn't overeat. So there's no not too much. It takes care of itself because the fiber in the food actually acts as the satiety agent. It's been taken out, so you'll eat more. And finally, mostly plants. Okay? Coke, Doritos, and Oreos are vegan. So protect the liver, feed the gut. Well, protect the liver from what? Well, protect the liver from the onslaught of sugar, for example. Because the, what do you think the liver does when it, re, when it gets that onslaught of sugar? Turns it into liver fat. The fat you saw on that slide. That liver fat is driving chronic metabolic disease. And you might have it sitting there right now. Because 45% of America does. I guarantee you, someone in this room's got a fatty liver who doesn't know it. And you could fix it right now by getting the sugar out of your diet. That simple. So protect the liver from sugar. Protect it from glyphosate. Protect it from heavy metals. Protect it from a whole bunch of things. And there are ways to do that. Feed the gut. Feed the gut what? Turns out you have 100 trillion Bacteria in your intestine. You only have 10 trillion cells in your body. Your bacteria outnumber you 10 to 1. Each of you is just a big bag of bacteria with legs. Now, those bacteria have to eat. The question is, what do they eat? Well, they eat what you eat. The question is, how much did you get versus how much did they get? And it turns out if you try to starve them, you know what happens? They don't like it. So they eat the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells, denuding those, that intestine, reducing your immunologic barrier and leading to inflammation, leaky gut, insulin resistance, chronic metabolic disease. Because you didn't feed your gut. Well, what does your gut eat? Fiber. But what's been taken out of our food? The food for the bacteria. So that fiber doesn't register as a nutrient because you don't absorb it. Guess what? It was never for you. It was for your bacteria. You are flooding your liver and starving your gut every single time you pick up a food that's packaged in a wrapper or in a can or in a tin or in a bottle. Every single time you are flooding your liver and starving your gut. And that is why America is sick. And we will not get well until we fix this. So, to wrap it up, you're here to figure out how you can do good and make money doing it. Can technology help companies do the right thing? And can you make money doing it? The answer is yes, you can. I'm here to tell you there are ways to do it. And these are the four buckets, if you will, that people can work on in order to do it. Changes in ingredients, okay? Get the sugar out. What about sugar substitutes? Some of them actually seem to have favorable metabolic profiles. Okay, we can talk about which ones at the panel. Okay, getting the sugar out. How about, you know, processing changes where the sugar gets eaten by, say, bacteria or filtered in some fashion. Okay. We're working on a special proprietary fiber that will sequester sugar from the early small intestine so that it's not available early on to flood your liver, but rather moves the food down the intestine to feed the gut, basically turning apple juice back into apples, as an example. Packaging. Okay. Juice is healthy, right? Try again. Okay. Juice is worse than soda. Okay? And if you think that little bit of vitamin C it make, makes up for all of that sugar and all that liver fat, okay, okay, I got another bridge on the other side to sell you. 
Okay, I got three of them, actually, just on this side of the East River alone. Bottom line, we got to get rid of that, um, that sugar, and the question is how best to do it. Could we do it with, say, juice shots fortified with specific micronutrients and ingredients that are actually pro-health? Maybe. You know, there are lots of different ways. And finally, data science. Okay? So I'm going to tell you about an effort that I'm involved in that I'm very proud of. Okay? You probably know that Dannon and Unilever underwent a sugar reduction exercise in the last year. And they both touted their success at removing 14% of the added sugar from their portfolio. Now, show of hands. Who thinks that's good? Who thinks that's bad? One guy in the back says it's bad. Nobody raised their hands for good. Okay, so you guys just don't know or you don't want to give away your secrets. I don't know which. I'm working with an international food conglomerate called KDD, Kuwaiti Danish Dairy. And they sell sugar in various forms. They sell it in yogurt. They sell it in ice cream. They sell it in um, uh, juice. They sell it in tomato sauce. I have been working with them. We have convened a scientific panel. And we have determined that we are going to be able to get 78% of the added sugar out of their diet by next year. 14%? Give me a friggin' break. 78% of the added sugar out of their diet, out of the portfolio for one company. And we're going to do that. And the reason we can do that is because KDD is not on any stock exchange. It's privately held. That's the reason. And so when that happens, we're going to serve as a model for the rest of the food industry. Any food company can do it. But you need data science to do it. So we are working with a uh, recommendation engine, a search engine called Perfect. And we've assembled 75,000 data points. We've analyzed every single uh, item in the KDD uh, uh, portfolio through Eurofins in order to figure out what's actually in the food. What do we have to fix? Do we have to get rid of cadmium out of the cocoa? Do we have to get rid of RBST? Do we have to <coughs> get rid of mercury, glyphosate? What sugars need to come out? And we're able to actually put data science to work to completely not just re-engineer, but reimagine an entire food company's portfolio and it's fair. So, Pa ingredients, processing, packaging, data science. Yes, there are ways for technology to make inroads, but you can only do it if you know what you're doing and if you do the right thing to start with. Because, and in order to do that, you have to know what the problem is. You cannot solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. And I have hopefully just defined the problem for you. So in closing, Hippocrates famously said, let thy food be thy medicine. Yeah, but Hippocrates never met McDonald's. What Hippocrates really meant to say was, good food is medicine. Bad food needs medicine. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be around all day. Thank you.